This is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. I want to bring to you an answer to the question, will Iran acquire a nuclear weapon? Will North Korea continue to destabilize the Korean Peninsula? What are the implications for Christianity and the church considering the continued rise of radical Islam. This is a prophetic perspective on these questions directly from the scriptures. And considering these issues, we can go to the book of Revelation and it reads like tomorrow's headlines. The promises of God and the clarity of prophetic insight that God gives are going to be an encouragement to you. And it's going to enlighten you as a believer to help you understand that no matter how bleak the outlook may be on the world scene, the sky isn't falling, the kingdom is coming. Now, when Iran first made the news in pursuit of nuclear technology, the Father spoke to me very clearly about the income. Over the years, I have seldom made definitive declarations about current events from a scripture perspective, but in this uh, message, I want to share insight specifically into the situation with the nation of Iran and some of the peripheral issues. Just as the scriptures and the prophets were definitive guides to world events in ancient times, so the scriptures and the prophets are relevant to the day that you and I live in if you take the time to search out what the Bible says and to listen to the voice of God. You see, in order to have a proper perspective, you have to realize what Hebrews talks about, that the word of God is a two-edged sword. Now, what are the two edges, what's the two-edged sword? It's the two dimensions of the, of the word of God. There is the Logos, which is the eternal word of God that the scriptures express. And then there is the Rhema, which is the prophetic word that is subjective but present in its application. Peter talked about this when he said we needed to be established in the present truth what God was currently in doing and saying. If you only pay attention to the Rhema, which is the prophetic word, then you're losing grounding in the Logos, the eternal Word of God, the Scriptures. If all you do is look to the Scriptures, then you're grounded in the Scripture, but you don't have the nuance and the present-day application of the now Word of God spoken through the prophetic. Now, in the news, we see that the Western nations have been trying to rein in the nation of Iran as they seek to become a jihadist nuclear state. This has implications for the West, for the U.S., and for the nation of Israel. What does the Bible say? What do the prophets say? Do the prophets of old, looking first at them, do the prophets of old speak to the issue of a jihadist nuclear state? You're going to find out in this message that in fact the scriptures do speak quite clearly to this issue as well as where North Korea figures in. We're going to look at the sixth chapter of Revelation and also at the history of Iran and what the geopolitical history of the region was before Iran became a nation. In the sixth chapter of John's Revelation, the passage speaks of the beginning of the opening of seven seals and what we commonly call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. As I read this passage a few years ago, I heard the Father say that the first of the seven seals had been opened. He further told me that the opening of this seal has to do directly with the nuclear ambitions of Islam, or radical Islam, and Iran in particular. Let's look at the passage. Revelations chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Then I saw... As the Lamb broke open, notice who's opening the seals, it's not the devil, it's the Lamb. As the Lamb broke open one of the seven seals, and as if in a voice, 
of thunder, I heard one of the four living creatures say, Come. And I looked and I saw there was a white horse. Now pay attention to this imagery because we're going to talk about this throughout the remainder of what we're going to say. There was a white horse whose rider carried a bow. And a crown was given him and he rode forth conquering and to conquer. So a rider carrying a bow. We're going to show you in the scriptures and show you in history that the imagery of a rider with a bow is specific imagery speaking of the ancient Parthians who were the predecessors of what Iran has now become as a nation state. And I want you to see something really important. This rider with the bow, a crown was given him. Now who gives out crowns? Does the devil give out crowns? The Bible says God sets up nations. He sets up one and he pulls down another. There's only one reason why the nation state of Iran exists. It's because God's allowed it. Now, does that mean that God is pro-jihadist in his agenda? No, it doesn't mean any of that because God doesn't look at the problem on the level of the problem. You're going to have to ascend, you're going to have to come to an ascension perspective on these things, not the perspective that Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or any of the talking heads are going to try and get you to think. Know this, God is in control. The sky is not falling. The kingdom is coming. Now, let's go on and read verse 3. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And another horse came out, flaming red. And its rider was empowered to take peace from the earth, so that men slaughtered one another. And he was given a huge sword. Interesting. And when he broke open the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come and look. And I saw, and behold, a black horse. And what this is revealing is a successive uh, course of events. One triggering another. The events that in, are indicated by the first seal, when it's opened, trigger what happens with the opening of the second, the third, the fourth, and, and so on and so forth. So, the third seal, the angel said, Come, I beheld, and a black horse, uh, and in his hand the rider had a pair of scales. And I heard what seemed to be, verse 6, a voice from the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and a, which is a whole day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. But do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, if you know your history, and the history of the time, then we're focusing primarily upon the first seal, and specifically the writer with a bow. Because he speaks directly to the issue of a nuclear Iran and a jihadist nuclear state. If you know your history and the history of the time that John wrote the book of Revelation, you will see that only the only mounted archers that were well known in the ancient Roman Empire at the time were the Parthians. When the Apostle John wrote the Revelation, Rome was facing war with the Parthian Empire. The book of Revelation is believed to have been written between the years 81 and 96. The Parthian Wars with Rome, they began long before Christ and they raged intermittently for centuries after the resurrection of the church was established before they came to their climax under the Emperor Trajan. Now, let's come back to Revelation chapter 6 verse 2. An ancient reader of the Apocalypse of John would make only one conclusion about the, white, the rider with the white horse carrying the bow. He would instantly think of the Parthians. The Parthians were masters at mounted archery, so much so that the Roman legions never developed an effective way to neutralize this Parthian tactic of war. The Parthians 
held on for so long, and they were not in some far-flung province of Rome. They were very near to Rome. They, they occupied the ancient lands where the nation of Iran is now. And so they were very much a close threat that the Romans were never to, able to overthrow, and they became a byword for terror. Roman children, the mothers, wouldn't say uh, the boogeyman was going to get them. They, would they were taught to be afraid of the Parthians. They would say the Parthians are going to get you because they were a, a symbol of terror. Uh, from the time brought from the eastern frontier of Rome, uh, from 250 years before Jesus and 250 years after the resurrection. And so when a Roman or a Greek or anyone who read the manuscript that John wrote and he saw a rider with a bow, he's instantly going to think the Parthians. And the Parthians were the predecessors of the Iranians, of the nation state of Iran. And so when John spoke this and the Spirit breathed it, he was speaking to us about a role that Iran would play, and it fits us and it locates us in the prophetic timeline. Now, the Parthians were mounted archers, and their mount of choice was a white horse. In fact, the mounted archer and the image of a Parthian archer on a white horse was the Parthian's claim to fame. It was, it was an iconic image in the culture of ancient Rome to whom John initially wrote the Revelation. So we can conclude that in the first seal, when the rider with the white horse comes out with, the, with a bow, that he is a symbol of the ancient Parthians and points down to our day to the nation state of Iran. And whatever happens with this archer and this mounted archer speaks to us of what's going to happen with Iran. And again, I say to you that the, kingdom, the sky isn't falling, the kingdom is coming. So what is the application for us today about this? This ancient people, the Parthians, had several things in common with modern-day Iran. First of all, again, where do you think the Parthians were located? They were located in the area that became modern-day Iran, eventually. The Parthians were the predecessors of modern-day Iran. Number two, the Parthian Empire represented the boundary between East and West, just as Iran sits on the geopolitical boundary between the Christian West and the Islamic Near East. Number three, the Parthians' form of warfare was guerrilla warfare. In other words, they were terrorists. That's why the Romans couldn't beat them. Also, like modern-day terrorists, their government was decentralized, making them very hard for the Romans to defeat. I, the word of the Lord, the thing that God is revealing, is that the first horseman of Revelation 6 arises from Islamist terrorism and Iran in particular. Radical Islam and the nation state of Iran are possessed with a spirit of world conquest much like we last saw with Hitler. Interestingly enough that Hitler and the Islamists were both fascist in their ideology. A fascist is an ultra-nationalist. Uh, radical Islamic scholars and university imams have been documented, boldly declaring, they've said, we will fly the crescent flag over Washington. We will fly the crescent flag over London, over Paris. Islamic extremism has a blind ambition to rule the West and establish an, uh, and establish Islamic world domination. What does the scripture say about this? And what are our expectations supposed to be? I think the answers will inform you and encourage you. In all the inquiry into world events, as they relate to the prophetic in your life, you have to remember, again, that the sky isn't falling, the kingdom is coming. When prophetic... Uh, inquirers uh, share these things and they they see the darkness and they see the gross darkness but yet the Bible says it's as morning spread on the mountains the prophets many of them that are speaking today they're describing the gross darkness but they're leaving out the morning spread on the mountains uh, they're looking at all they're leaving this open-ended dark scenario 
And it's not that they're seeing inaccurately. The Father said many times, the doom and gloomers have seen some things. Yet what they have not seen is the morning spread on the mountains, is the kingdom of God, the children of, of God, like the children of Israel in the land of Goshen, when the known world was deconstructed in Moses' time, but the children of Israel came out blessed, came out prospered, just like the early church. When the Middle East was, was about to go through total upheaval, the, the city of Jerusalem destroyed, the, the nation of Israel completely deconstructed, but the children of, of God, the early church, they were prospering, they were blessed, None of them, they were completely out of debt, and God moved them in his timetable, and they were protected from all of the destruction that came on those who could not see the prophetic insight that God was revealing. So the sky isn't falling. The kingdom is coming. Any viewpoint that leaves you with another conclusion is either misguided or needs to be refined and reconsidered. Will radical Islam and the terrorist state of Iran go nuclear? From the scriptures, I don't see this happening. But the fact is, they do have an ambition. The fact that they have this ambition is a fulfillment of Revelation 6, 2. And it speaks and it predicted in John's day the destabilization of the Western world leading up to the opening of the second seal, which is the red horse of war, who's given power to take peace from the earth. So what is the ambition of uh, the jihadists and the terrorist nation states? What's going to be the impact of that on the world as we know it? Well, it's going to bring us to widespread conventional warfare. Notice I said conventional warfare. And if you study in Revelation 6, you see that whatever the first seal represents, it triggers the second seal, which is widespread conventional warfare. And now, so you have, that may not make you feel comfortable, but we have to go by what the scripture reveals. And then as you study what the first uh, seal opening represents, and the rider with a bow on a white horse, what that means, it only means Iran, and more specifically Iran, but more broadly, extremist, jihadist Islam. The four horsemen passage then of Revelation 6 is a picture of the cultural, technological, and political instability resulting in widespread conventional warfare in the Middle East spilling out into the far-flung corners of the world. Now, let's consider some more comparisons with the riders, all of the riders in Revelation 6 and also the white horse in Iran. Here's where we get the answer about will Iran get the bomb. Notice that the horseman has a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. Go read it. You need to look at this. These are things, hey, Fox News wants you to think about this. CNN wants you to think about this. Uh, the Talking Heads want you to think about this. Well, you need to go to the scripture and, and look at this the way God, God says. See? So the horseman that comes out, he has a bow, but he has no arrows. That perfectly describes where Iran is today. Iran has the delivery system for nuclear weapons, but no warheads to put in them, and no properly enriched fuel to arm them. They have the ballistic missiles, the delivery system, that's the bow, but no warheads, no missiles, no arrows. And judging by Revelation 6, they're not going to get them. The influence of Islamic extremism, according to the prophetic timeline, what it's going to result in is the destabilization of the West, and then we've seen this since 911. And, and even since the, the barracks was bombed in Reagan's day in Lebanon, the Islam has destabilized the West, and more importantly, the, the primary impact of radical Islamic terrorism, who are the who are the uh, inheritors, whose predecessors were the ancient Parthians, who were destabilizing the West for 500 years during the time of, of Jesus, and ultimately brought about the fall of of the ancient Roman Empire. Likewise, they're destabilizing the West today. And look, that's not a bad thing. God is not a Western God. 
God rules over all. God's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. Am I saying that a nation is going to fall? No, but I am making the observation that since uh, 9 one the United States' position as a superpower has eroded. And if you study end time scripture, you will see the United States doesn't figure in. You see European powers, you see uh, the Soviet, former Soviet Union, you see Russia and the Baltic states figuring in to the prophetic timeline, but you do not see the United States. So whatever happens in the, in the earth leading up to the time of the return of Christ and moving into the millennial reign, it's going to be a time when the role of the United States as a superpower is going to be diminished. And terrorism has brought that about. And let me tell you something. Before you're an American, you belong to the kingdom of God. And we don't like to see this for an American. We're not advocating for it. We're not doing like some prophets who are saying the sky is falling and will somebody just overthrow the government. That's ignorance. That's ridiculous. But we need to know that the United States position as a superpower has been eroded by radical Islam since the rise of global uh, terrorism. We've seen that, first of all, the Soviet Union ceased to be a superpower, but the standing of the U.S. as a world power has steadily been in decline. They say, well, but we've gone to war. Yeah, think about that. We had to draw arms in order to maintain our position. We weren't able to sit back in Washington and write a check and keep everybody happy. So we're having to enforce. It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of the eroding of the United States standing as a global superpower. See, there's a voice of global leadership in the earth. According to the scriptures, into that void, where the United States has begun to appear weak, into that void is going to arise a charismatic leader, probably from Western Europe, who's ultimately going to fulfill the will of the role of the Antichrist. Oh, that's bad news. No, it's not. He works for the losing team. What's your problem? In any consideration of events in the Middle East, also, you cannot ignore North Korea. Nor, in other words, what about China? China is a superpower. You cannot ignore North Korea. North Korea is an ally of Iran and a partner with Iran in their nuclear ambitions. But sooner or later, North Korea is going to fall under the weight of its own deprivations and its starving people. The looming economic disaster and destabilization of North Korea is going to serve to neutralize the nation of China. China is not going to rule the world. The United States is not going to be the primary superpower. God is going to allow, in his time frame, a European leader to rise up, and this European leader is going to take on the role of the Antichrist. And all that is, is God bringing the world systems to failure so that the Western powers are not the answer, China is not the answer, Europe, Western Europe is not the answer, and when everyone has come to failure and they don't know where to look, they're going to look at the body of Christ and believers uh, walking in the earth in power and stability when everyone else cannot find any, any firm ground to stand on. And they're going to come to us and say, take us to your leader. Because the sky, for us, the sky isn't falling, the kingdom is coming. So the destabilization of North Korea is going to neutralize the nation of China as a player on the world scene. By occupying China with a massive humanitarian crisis with North Korea falls. The number one economic of challenge of China is supporting an aging population on the backs of the one child generation when they outlawed having more than one child. Because of this policy of social engineering, China has shot itself in the foot by facing an, uh, uh, supporting an aging generation with very large families being supported by a generation of workers who had only one child. The financial crisis looming for China is staggering. And when North Korea falls and, and millions of refugees flood across her northern border, it's going to push uh, uh, China into a scenario of great governmental instability and potential civil war. Even in a booming economy in the U.S. or in China, we're facing those problems as well is where we have smaller families supporting the baby boom generation that was born after World War II. 
And it's crippling. It's crippling to our working class populations, both in China and the U.S. But what will be the economic situation over the next two decades? Well, look at Revelation 6. War affects an economy. The rider with the bow, in other words, jihadist, radical Islam seeking to become a nuclear power, pushes, the war, pushes uh, events in the first seal to bring about what happens in the second rider, who is the one who represents war, widespread conventional war. Now, war affects economies. If what I see is correct, the first seal is now open. This is the destabilizing influence by Islamic extremists that will pit the nations of the West against one another and against other nations in a blame game as they try to maintain uh, access uh, to the oil fields of the Arabian Peninsula and keep their hand on the energy spigot because they can bring the world to its knees just by turning off the oil. So, in the midst of the Islamic threat, what is happening? Well, the nations of the UN are scrambling and impotently to keep a low profile, to avoid the consequences of provoking uh, the oil-soaked Arab uh, peninsula into withdrawing, uh, giving a, a, sending barrels of oil, hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil to us. You know, there was a former terrorist who's now become a, a Christian. He said that oil is the wine of the Western powers fornication that the Bible talks about. In other words, we'll do anything to keep that flowing. And it doesn't matter. We'll sell out Israel. We see that, we see that happening. You can blame it on Barack Obama, but it was being done under the Bush administration. Uh, Bush uh, 2, Bush 1 sat back and allowed Israel to be uh, destabilized and did very, very little, if nothing, to make a difference. This has been going. Why? because of the, the oil is the wine of the Western powers fornication and they will let anything happen. And there's a lot of background to that, uh, to that story. See, the Western nations tremble to see the flow of oil disrupted and they will make any compromise to keep oil flowing. Then comes the red horsemen. See, out of the environment of instability caused by Islamic terrorism now seeking to become a nuclear state, a nuclear power, now the red horsemen, ultimately the red horsemen of conventional war that represents a general descent of the nations of the world into war and chaos. See, the red horseman has the power to take peace from the earth. This is what the Parthians in their day contributed to ancient Rome. Rome was battling the Parthians with full force, and then all of a sudden civil war broke out and caused the Romans to have less than total victory. So in other words, the pressure that the Parthians brought upon ancient Rome pushed Rome into civil war. Likewise, the pressure of radical Islam has caused the nations, NATO is not walking in agreement. What do we see? The UK is pulling out. They're not supporting us like they, they used to. Germany's not supporting us like they used to. Everybody's looking out for their own because radical Islam, represented by the rider with the bow, is, is challenging those, those ancient and long-held loyalties. See, like today in the U.S. and in the West, we're not having total victory over the Iran-backed Islamist extremists in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq because of the instability and the inability to come together as a unified front against this threat. Drawn to its likely outcome, we see the Red Horsemen weighing the confused nations of the West down and dragging them into total strife, bickering, and war. In this atmosphere of confusion, Every warlord and every dictator with a tank or an M16, and we've seen this happen in North Africa, they're going to take up arms against his neighbor. And then we come, what happens there? In this increased uh, destabilization, the third horseman representing famine is, comes forth. This horseman will have a tremendous effect on the modern Western family. We've already seen it in the escalating price of, of food. He noticed that he causes the wheat uh, uh, to, he says, see that you hurt not the wheat, but yet the prices skyrocket. You know, barley was the poor man's bread. When he says, hurt not the wine and the oil, what does the wine and the oil represent? 
Wheat and barley are necessary staples. Oil and wine are luxuries. So we see the lower classes, economic classes, struggling to keep the basics on the table, but the upper class still enjoys their luxuries. So it points to the destabilization of our culture through Islamic radicalism, bringing pressure between the nations, pushing them into unwanted conventional wars, of which we've had two. And as a result, prices go up, the middle class shrinks, the, the impoverished classes grow, but yet, isn't it interesting that the Dow is breaking uh, uh, records regularly because this is a state of affairs that is good for the elite and the super rich. What does that mean for us? It means in the time of the third horseman now, in a time of, of we're going to see, look, we're going to be at war in time, we're going to be in a conventional war with Iran. We're going to have boots on the ground in the Middle East for a long time to come in different campaigns and circumstances and situations. But it, during this time, it's going to cause economic trouble and people are going to be struggling to make it. Burdened down by taxes to care for an aging population, hello, Obamacare, and to pay the expensive cost of war after war. And let me tell you something, this isn't the Democrats' fault. God is not a Democrat. You know, the conservative uh, Christian demographic has, has almost come out and said, if you're a Democrat, you're not saved. That's a lie. In fact, God's judgment is, is more harsh upon the Republican Party and the conservative political party now because they've espoused policies that have, that have made things difficult for, the, for uh, single parent families, made things difficult uh, for the hiring, for the working class, and they've wiped their mouth and said, we didn't do anything wrong, it's those nasty Democrats' fault. And they've named the name of God while they've done it, and declared they're the name of God and country, and tried to manipulate the church by the political process. And God is bringing that to total failure, not because the Republicans are worse than the Democrats, but because they named his name for their own selfish and greedy purposes to have power and control in this country, and God has breathed upon them and taken away the bishopric of the executive branch of government from the Republican Party, not because he chooses the Democratic Party, but because they've brought themselves to judgment and discipline by their hypocrisy and by their brutal and cruel policies toward those, the widow, the impoverished, and the hireling, the orphan, that the Father champions historically throughout the Scriptures. So we see the middle class continuing to shrink, if not effectively disappearing altogether. Uh, how will we know this? When we see the trend in the U.S. to adopt a British-style social reform, including subsidized unemployment, continued long-term permanent subsidization of unemployment, and socialized medicine. What is God's purpose in all of this? To push the U.S. and China, the only remaining superpowers, into preoccupation with internal powers, making more room for God to allow the Antichrist to come forward in Western Europe, out of prospering nations like Germany, and to bring about the culmination of his kingdom and his purpose. What about the rapture? Well, whatever your view is on the parousia, or the rapture, the implications of the writings of Daniel, Ezekiel, and John in the Revelation point to a massive intervention by God between the second horseman and the fourth horseman. See, what does that mean? Are we going to see tribulation? It doesn't matter. The sky isn't falling. The kingdom is coming. In ancient Rome, when Christians were slaughtered wholesale by Nero and his successors, the father worked. To bring the known world trembling to the foot of the cross in just over three generations. We don't, it's not a question of escape, not escape. Our focus has to be on the fact that we are not pitiful, powerless victims. We are principalities and powers in God playing a pivotal role in the earth as the church and as individuals to bring about the purposes of God. What does this mean for you and I now? It means that things geopolitically may get worse before they get better. 
it's likely that we're going to see widespread conventional warfare with boots on the ground in Iran and in North Korea. We may see the draft reinstated when the second seal is open and conventional warfare begins to break out in an escalated manner. If the first seal is now open, and I believe it's clear from the scripture that it is, this is the next unfolding event. What if the draft is reinstated at World War II levels? What if all the men in your household of age are drafted and sent to foreign fields? What steps would you take to safeguard your families and your fortunes? If the middle class is under attack and facing uh, effective extinction, you should consider what that might mean for you and for your family. And that doesn't mean go build a bunker. What's, but what steps would you take to keep a roof over your head and a livelihood before you to support your loved ones? Let's remember this. Psalm 91 verse 14. Though a thousand fall at your right hand and ten thousand at your left, like the children of Israel in coming out of Egypt, it will not come near you. Like the early church when Jerusalem and the, city, the nation of Israel was destroyed. You set your love upon him and you know his name. And you will walk in the preservation, prosperity, and protection as the known world is decompiled around you. This is no time to play games with God. Or to let anything outside your walk with God be your security. Not your job, your culture, your country. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Not your political affiliation. But see, God is bringing about his purposes. And his purposes trump political process. They trump military intervention. That's why he said it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. We need to return to our ancient strengths in the body of Christ. And as the early church turned to the power of prayer to be found on our knees, and you're going to see a great awakening poured out and a great salvation revival come into the culture of the West as we lose our faith and, and relinquish the idolatry we've had toward the political process and toward the stability of our nations and begin to look to the kingdom of God as the only anchor of security as God moves to decompile and to deconstruct human government as the rock cut out of the mountain strikes the image in Daniel and the nations of the world are completely brought to nothing and the government of God is set up on the earth of which you and I will be the active participants. God bless you.